Hey everyone, my name is Neil Rakesh, and I'm one of the attendings in the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And today we're gonna to be talking about cancer pain etiologies, their treatment, and the billing associated with it. So before we start, let's get a little context about uh, cancer itself. Cancer is the second lead of cause of death in the world. And this accounts for about 10 million in 2020. Uh, and this is according to the World Health Organization. Now, if you break that down a little bit more, you can see that the most common causes of cancer in men are gonna be your prostate cancers, lung, colorectal, skin cancers, and even bladder cancers. In women, this tends to be breast cancer, and then you get your lung cancers, skin cancer, and GYN cancers, as well as colorectal cancers. Uh, and if you take a look at this uh, interesting uh, radar graph, this is a graph that was done by Malhotra et al. in uh, Sloan Kettering in 2017. And it actually kind of matches up very similar to what the world population is like. So the patients that we see at Sloan Kettering, we see the same kind of things. A large amount of patients that are, have breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, and we even have the colorectal and GYN cancer. So a lot of the patients we see are representative of what we see in the population. How many of these actually have pain? A review that was done in 2016 by Vanderbuken showed that of all the cancer patients, about 38% of these patients are gonna end up having pain. If they start to undergo some kind of treatment like chemotherapy or radiation, the, this number jumps up. It jumps up to about 39 to 55%. If these patients progress to the terminal or metastatic diseases, this is gonna be about 66.4%. Now, I'm gonna say this even kind of more to another level. When we see the patients at Sloan, these are patients that have been seen before in the community, and they may have gone through some various forms of treatment, and then they end up coming to us here at Sloan. So these patients may have undergone treatment, or they're in the advanced metastatic disease. So a lot of our patients end up experiencing a lot of different types types of pain. Now, what causes pain in the cancer population? There are a few things that really cause it. One could be the cancer, two, it could be the treatment itself, or three, it could be from the surgery. Now, of the cancers, the main cancers that do cause pain are bone, nerve, visceral organs, which are the internal organs, uh, as well as blood cancers. Now, when we look at bone, this tends to be the most painful of all the, all the cancers that you can get. And they tend to be metastatic or progress from somewhere else. And this tends to metastasize or spread to the bones of the spine. So the vertebra could be the pelvis, the ribs, the femur, which is the leg bone, or the skull. Um, you can even get primary bone cancers, which can be painful as well. So osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, as well as chondrosarcoma. And there even is another cancer called multimyeloma, which can spread kind of diffusely throughout the bones. And what you get are these things called lytic lesions, which can be painful on their own, but what they tend to be, what they tend to cause is breaks or fractures within the bone, which can be exquisitely painful. When it comes to nerves, nerves tend to be, tend to cause pain when they're pushed upon. So we can have tumors that are pushing on these nerves. Now you can have the nerves of the, of the neck, which go into the arms themselves. And Tumors like breast cancer or lung cancers can have tumors in the kind of top portion along the brachial plexus. They're called pancose tumors. And this can create pain that shoots down the arms to the hands and the fingers, and it can be exquisitely painful. This can happen also in the legs. This is also known as lumbosacral plexopathy. This can be caused from colorectal cancers, GYN cancers, even muscle, uh, muscle cancers that push along these nerves that go to the legs. And then finally, you can also get cancers that affect the nerves specifically. So this could be like schwannomas and can present with very similar things, radiating pain down the arms or the legs. For visceral organs or internal organs, each of these things are gonna have different types of pain that you're gonna see as associated with it. So brain causes headache. In things inside of the chest, um, chest cavity can cause, uh, they can cause chest pain, they can cause back pain, thoracic back pain, which is the middle or upper portion of the back. You can have cancers as a part of the abdomen, the stomach area, and this can create abdominal pain. It can even create low back pain. And then finally of the pelvis. So these are things like uh, uterine cancers or any kind of low rectal cancers. These can create abdominal pain as well as rectal pain. And like the lumbosacral plexopathy, this can cause radiating pain down the legs. Blood cancers um, can also cause pain. This is very uncommon, but leukemia can cause pain. So this can cause bone pains or diffuse arthralgias, which is also joint pains, um, just all over. Uh, now, if we shift gears, the treatments themselves can cause a lot of pain. So chemotherapy is a prime offender. Uh, 
it is toxic to high mitotic indices. And what this means is that any area that has a high amount of cell turnover, cells are constantly reproducing, like blood, for example, um, are prone to chemotherapy uh, kind of toxicities. And this would be the bone marrow, this would be the gut or the GI area. And what this would present as is something like oral mucositis, which is an inflammation or irritation of the mouth or the inner lining of the mouth. And this can be very painful, make it very difficult for people to swallow or eat. Um, you can have things called chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, where you have numbness and tingling in the fingertips or the toes. Uh, and this is with specific chemotherapy agents as well. And this is kind of like a diabetic peripheral neuropathy as well. Um, you can also have you can also have nerves that are affected called motor nerves, which are nerves that are important for moving muscles or uh, in the body. You can also have nerves that are affected that are autonomic nerves. These are these comp these com these compose of the automatic nerves. So things like um, important for constipation or can cause constipation, it can cause abdominal pain. It's also important in regulating blood pressure. So things like orthostatic hypotension can, can happen where you're unable to keep your blood pressure high enough and you can faint or you become dizzy as a result of it. Now, there are different variations of when you get chemotherapy induced uh, induced syndrome. So it can be from the infusion itself and you have a whole kind of slew of different things that happen as a result of that or it can be as a result of the chemotherapy that creates a toxic reaction in the body. Uh, and those are some of the things I just mentioned in what I went through. Uh, an interesting thing is that some of the new chemotherapy agents do not cause as much side effects. So things like CAR T cell or anti tumor vaccines um, may not cause as many side effects. And this is actually an interesting thing that we see. A lot of patients get better and better very quickly after the after their their chemotherapy, but some of these patients may still have these chronic conditions like uh, like just the general arthritis, uh, arthritis of the body, which can end up developing much sooner uh, in these patients as a result of the chemotherapy. So this could affect them 10, 15 years down the line. Radiation can cause pain as well. This is about 50 to 70% of patients um, that have uh, that have pain. And there's different gradations of this. Someone that has a very low amount of radiation may only get chest wall pain. Someone that has a very high amount of radiation could get things that are deeper. So the deeper tissues like the esophagus or the rectum can be irritated as a result or injured as a result of this radiation. This can be exquisitely painful for people to eat or go to the bathroom. Uh, another interesting thing is that nerves can be affected as a result of radiation. And this presents very in, in a very interesting way. It can be delayed even from one to 10 years after the radiation, someone's nerves can be irritated at a delayed amount of time. Um, and again, this can pre present as radiating pain down the arms, down the legs, or even pain in the, in the, the chest wall area. And finally, surgeries. Um, these can also cause pain. About 20 to 56% of patients are going to have pain after the surgery. This tends to resolve, but in 5 to 10% of those patients, they develop severe pain. This is pain that's greater than 5 to 10 out of 10 um, on the visual analog scale. And this can be present as a post mastectomy pain syndrome, post thoracotomy, post amputation, or even just the muscles or the scars themselves from the surgery can cause pain. So how exactly does it look when you see something? Now, if you're involved in the bill and the coding, you may just see these numbers just pop up on the screen or whenever anyone uh, kind of sends you something, this is what you see. You may see 64420, which is the intercostal nerve block. You may see 76942, which is an ultrasonic guidance for needle placement. But what does this really mean and how did the patient really get there to these codes? Well, let's let me paint a picture. Let's say, for example, we have a patient that uh, that comes across. Maybe they have a lump in their breast. Maybe they've they've noticed something a little bit different. They go to their doctor. They mention this, and the doctor says, "Yeah, you actually you actually have a lump there. Let's get a little bit more. Uh, let's get a little more imaging. Let's let's investigate this a little bit more." They may get a mammogram. They may get an ultrasound, and they find that maybe there is something there. They may say, "Let's get a biopsy. Let's get a sample of this and see what it truly is." The sample comes back and it actually shows a form of cancer. And now the patient may undergo some form of chemotherapy or radiation. But a lot of these patients that have breast cancer in a specific area end up getting surgery. They end up getting mastectomies. They may get mastectomies on both sides. A lot of these patients will end up doing very well. They'll they'll not really have any pain uh, after, the, well, they'll have a little bit of pain after the surgery, but it will resolve after, after a month or so. But some of these patients will develop this refractory pain known as post mastectomy pain. And this presents in kind of the front of the chest or maybe the side of the chest wall. Uh, and this can be exquisitely painful. They're gonna try a lot of different things where 
a bunch of different medications. There can be nerve medications, muscle medications, even opiates um, can can be helpful for the pain. There are topical creams and ointments uh, that can be used. There's even things like TENS units, which are known as transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulators, which is kind of like a deep, deep massage. Patients may also try physical therapy and occupational therapy. But if all of these fail, these patients end up coming to me. And what we do is interventions. And these interventions classify as injections as kind of the first thing that we would do. This is a very classic injection that we do for patients. On the right side, you can see an ultrasound in a needle that's going into the side of the chest area. And the left side, you can see the ultrasound image. And you can see the needles going above a muscle called the serratus anterior. This is kind of the higher up or the superficial plane of the serratus anterior. The needle first puts a medication there, and then it goes deeper below the serratus anterior and then goes adjacent to the intercostal nerve and we deliver a medication. This medication is a mixture of numbing medication and steroids. This tends to be quite effective for these patients. These patients come back after about a month and they more often than not say that they're doing well. Their pain is significantly better. They may not need any medications. They're able to do physical therapy and they're doing well. Some of these patients, even at three months are doing well or six months. Some patients will come back after three to six months and they say, hey, I need a repeat injection. We will repeat these every so often and they become less and less frequent and the patients um, will continue to do well after these injections. So this is a very classic injection for post mastectomy pain syndrome. But what are all the different types of things that we can do for patients that are in pain? Now, there's a multiple different things that we could do. I went over the medications uh, kind of briefly, but there are nerve medications, opiates, there are muscle relaxants, there are anticonvulsants, there are, there are topical creams and ointments that we can use, physical therapy, occupational therapy, even alternative medicine, which classifies as things like acupuncture, medical marijuana, massage. Um, some of the things that we do at Sloan Kettering are low intensity focus ultrasound, which is a kind of an ultrasound therapy that kind of uh, deeply massages some of those nerves that are irritated uh, by chemotherapy. And this is that chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy that I talked about in the fingers and the toes. And it tends to uh, tends to alleviate some of their pain and produce more, maybe more of a pleasant sensation for them. Ketamine infusions, which is typically used as a sedative, but when used at low dosages can also help with chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy. Um, we talked about the injections as well. And these are the conservative things that we can do for a patient. If they're refractory to these very simple things, what we do are implantable things. We can do implantable pain pumps, spinal cord stimulators, peripheral nerve stimulators. And when it gets when it gets kind of really bad, and these treatments don't work for these patients, we work with our neurosurgical colleagues as well as our interventional radi radiation colleagues. Um, and we will do in kind of cutting of nerves, killing of nerves, um, even implanting cement into bones to try to stabilize them. So if someone has a fracture or a break in the spine, for example, you can put cement in that and it will stabilize it and alleviate the pain. There's even radiation that's used palliatively to help with pain. Uh, and that can be very effective as well. I'm not going to delve too much into the research, but Here's just kind of a very surface level amount of what uh, what the research that exists and why we do what we do. Now, one of the kind of bread and butter things that we do is epidural steroid injections. Imagine if there's a tumor within the spine next to some of those nerves, it can create a radiating pain that goes down the legs or the arms. Um, there are a few studies that have looked at this. Um, Dr. Galati and, uh, and myself and a few other people um, have done uh, various studies throughout the years. And basically what it shows is that it's safe and effective to do epidural steroid injections adjacent to, to tumors um, that are pushing on nerves. And this can be quite effective at alleviating pain for significant periods of time for these patients. Um, ultrasound guided injections, as we just kind of talked about, one of my favorite things is the stellate ganglion block. So one of the things we talked about is a brachial, brachial plexopathy from a tumor that exists like a lung, lung tumor or a breast tumor, and it causes radiating pain down the arms. What we can do is we can inject some medication next to the nerves up here, the stellate ganglion, and that can alleviate that pain that patients feel. There's also low intensity focus ultrasound for chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy. That tends to be quite effective as well. Um, and then we have things that are a little bit more higher grade neurolyses of things like the celiac, plex celiac plexus or the lumbar sympathetic plexus. Uh, these are used for kind of significant pains in the internal organs. So the celiac plexus uh, specifically is a home run as I say, for patients that have pancreatic cancer. So this presents as pain in the stomach area or the abdomen, which is just really terrible, doesn't respond to medications. And what you can do is put a very potent form of alcohol along some of those nerves in the spine 
known as the celiac plexus, and it will kill those nerves. And this will provide significant relief for years after, after getting this procedure. Uh, and so this is a pretty useful injection for these patients. Uh, and as I said, if we get through the whole slew of different conservative things that we have, the medications and the injections, and it's still not cutting it, uh, this is when we go to implantable things. And there's various studies looking at spinal cord stimulation, intrathecal pain pumps um, for various types of cancers that, um, that, that exist. Now, this is the World Health Organization pain ladder, uh, or the WHO ladder. And I find this to be a very simple way of thinking about how we go through the medications. If someone has a very mild amount of pain, you start with the non-opiates like Tylenol or Gabapentin, which is a nerve medication, or a muscle relaxant. If their pain is really, really bad, you start ramping them up on kind of these short-acting opiates for a little amount of pain. If the pain is really severe, then you start going toward these long-acting, consistent opiates that the patient needs to control their pain. Now, if we expound upon this, this is something that I created, the Interventional Cancer Pain Tier System. Now, the medications, the therapies, and the turnovers, and the who ladder, that's consistently going on throughout the entire thing. But as this is happening, the different interventional options that I mentioned are going to be going on concurrently. So in Tier 1, we have our injections that we can use to try to alleviate pain. Maybe this works for a few months. If it doesn't really resolve the pain for a long period of time, we might do temporary implants in Tier 2, which would be something like a peripheral nerve stimulator. In tier three, if patients are still experiencing a lot of pain, we might do ablative things, which means that we're going to kill nerves um, like that celiac plexus neurolysis. Uh, and then in tier four, this is where we do our kind of very, very kind of end of the line things. And we do this with our neurosurgical colleagues and our interventional radiology colleagues, um, where we do kyphoplasties, which is putting cement in bones, or things like a chordotomy, which is where we cut nerves in the spine directly so patients do not feel pain at all uh, in specific limbs or areas. And these are kind of very end of the line treatments that we do for patients. Um, this is a nice little diagram that I actually created for um, the fellows that I, that I helped train. And it kind of breaks it down into a very easy way to think about things. Now, this is oversimplified, but imagine if a patient has these different types of pains. These are the different types of injections and interventions that we can do for that patient to try to help with that patient's pain. Now, I took this as a reason to try to say, how do we break this down into what you may see? This is, uh, this is kind of the general CPT codes for the different types of interventions we do. If you look at the different types of muscle injections that we do, joint injections, sympathetic nerves or peripheral nerves, even the implantable life devices, these are the various CPT codes that we are going to see that you come across when we are billing for these things. And hopefully this provides a little context for what you're seeing and why you're, why you're billing and applying for these authorizations. Um, based on what uh, on what the diagnoses are or what the presentation is. So hopefully that was very helpful. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to talk at this conference. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Mm -hmm.